Good afternoon and welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Arts and Culture Committee. Commission, it is a Thursday, August 15th. Can we have roll call, please? Commissioners Derhovanesian? Here. Kevanian? Here. Lee? Here. Sharikian? Yes. Chairperson Deaver? Here. The agenda for the August 15th meeting was posted on the bulletin board outside City Hall on August 19th, 2013. Next item. Item two, consent items at 2A, approval of meeting minutes from July 18th, 2013. Do you have a motion or? I will, I will move the minutes. Second. Roll call. Commission, Commissioner Dehovanesian? Yes. Kevanian? Yes. Lee? Yes. Sharikian? Yes. Chairperson Deaver? Yes. Next item. Item three, introductions and presentations. And I'd actually like to switch the order of and, and start with uh, 3B. At 3B, presentation of mayor's commendation to Rosnick Gregorian, presented by Chair Deaver. And it is my absolute honor to be able to present this to, uh, to uh, Commissioner Gregorian. Um, I will and read what we have here in our folder um, in appreciation May I ask you to come forward first, please? <laughs> I haven't done this before. You have to work with me on it. I apologize. Introduce yourself. Good afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. In appreciation for your commitment and your years of service on the Arts and Culture Commission, for your creative vision while serving on the Commission was vital to the successful development and adoption of the City's Arts and Cultural Plan the City of Glendale recognizes and commends your efforts to help the arts thrive in our community for years to come, and signed by Dave Weaver, our Mayor of Glendale. And I'm going to Thank you. bring this down to you. Sure, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> well, I'm very touched and honored to receive this uh, certification and commendation. This is a great honor for me, and I believe for any citizen who will get an award like this. And um, again, quite often I'm, I don't, I'm not speechless often, but this is one of the times that I'm a little speechless. And um, it is kind of ironic that this is the certificate and the award that I really campaigned very hard to bestow on our citizens for their, com com uh, for their uh, contribution to the arts and culture. And I become the first recipient of it. <laughs> it's, it is kind of very, very uh, great honor and very touchy. And if I knew that I was going to get a certificate like this, I would have campaigned maybe with a little check coming with it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is good enough. It pays more than any check would have paid because of the recognition of the uh, hard work that all the commissioners in this city, including myself, a former commissioner, would get. And it is very important for all the c c community members to uh, contribute to, to our own community, to our own city, to the well-being of our community because after all we all live in here and we are a team, we are a family and whatever decision we make will um, affect everybody else. So I am really honored to receive this. As a very little note, quite often my colleagues, my former colleagues and current colleagues call me and ask me what I'm doing. I'll just give you a very little brief history of the past month and a half. Uh, I am still a, a private citizen. I do my work. I live. I have the ups and downs in my life, in business and in personal life, and all, like all the rest of us. So I came to realize that I'm just a normal person. I'm not a superhuman. But having said that, um, in the art world, I have been um, honored to be approached 
by the Glendale Youth Alliance, which is a wonderful uh, youth organization in the city of Glendale. Uh, and they are organizing an exhibition um, of art uh, for in November, November 7th. Please mark your calendars and this will, event will come to you uh, hopefully next month. Um, and uh, I, I was approached by them to curate their exhibition, which I gladly accepted. It is for a good cause, again, for the youth of our community and our community. I have helped several uh, artists to showcase their artwork and uh, actually uh, a, two very nice young uh, upcoming artists in Glendale. I, I will name uh, Meline Martin and Celine Hovan, uh, Haruchunian. Uh, they asked me with the help of Commissioner Derovanesian to help them to organize their uh, uh, event which was an exhibition in their private home and I, I gladly accepted, helped them out, and it was really a very successful exhibition. And strangely enough, some of the community members are approaching me asking for some consultation about purchasing art or doing some events and things, and it seems that the community is pushing me to change my line of business and becoming an art consultant or a <laughs> art gallery owner or something, which will happen probably. We don't know yet, but <laughs> please stay tuned. And. Um, the last thing that uh, I wanted to say, um, uh, you know, again, I'm so excited, I'm, I, I keep on losing my mind. Um, the, uh, oh, and I have added to my nice collection several really nice paintings, and hopefully one day they will be also uh, exhibited. And most of you who have not seen it, hopefully you will see it. But I have added something like about 18 paintings in this past two, two months on my collection. So I've been quite active, and <laughs> as I promised you, I will be around, I will not go away, and as I promised you, I will always be there for our city, for our community, and especially for the arts and culture community, in case there is anything needed, I'm always there for you. And again, thank you so much for all your commitment and for your, recommend, for your commendation, and I thank Mayor Weaver on this and the City Council also. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we are thankful to have you as a continuing partner um, in our community, always. Next item. At 3A, Library Arts and Culture Events, presented by Chuck Weick, Community Relations Manager. Good afternoon, Chairperson Deaver, Commissioners, City Staff. I'm going to give you a brief outline of what's going on or what's coming up at the library. Uh, in the rest of this month in August, in September, uh, we've got a bunch of events and a special, special kind of outreach that we're going to tell you about today. Uh, of course, uh, at the end of the month, we've got Geraldine Saunders. She's a Glendale resident, born and raised in Glendale. She was the original Love Boat lady. So when they made that TV show in the 70s, they based it on her career uh, and really her book. So uh, another Glendale resident, Sheila Murray, has done a biography of Geraldine, and they, they promised to bring a three-foot replica of the love boat that they're going to plug in, and you'll see lights uh, that night. So I hope you can all make it. That's August 28th. Um, Brand Library uh, Associates have a, a series of films that they've put on this last year. And August 22, next week, uh, they're going to show Fahrenheit 451. Uh, that's Ray Bradbury's, uh, one of the best adaptations of, of one of his books, uh, 1953, I believe. Uh, the neat thing about it, they've got a guy named Stephen Paul Leva. And he's a writer. He helped. Um, the city of LA designate a street corner Ray Bradbury Way down there by the Central Library. He's going to be there afterwards to talk about his uh, experiences with Ray Bradbury. He's got a new book called Searching for Ray Bradbury. And if you visit the Central Library, we also have a collection of, as you'd call it, memorabilia uh, of Ray Bradbury. A collector brought it in, mostly books, but I believe there's a bottle of dandelion wine under glass, and I, I don't think that uh, we don't need a permit for that. Do we? 
<laughs> you know. um, no, it's it's in a case. You can't get at it. But it's it's pretty cool. There's there's a lot of signed things from Ray. Uh, you may know. I don't know if you were around. Ray uh, was the very first speaker for the Friends of the Library in 19. Yeah, and and we had approximately 1,800 people at the Central Library. Build the place. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, Masis is a brand new novel from Rafi Kevorkian. Uh, he's coming on September 12th to the Central Library. Another event, you may know Eric Nazarian, a uh, pretty well-known filmmaker. He's coming back. He's got a 20-minute film called Bolas, uh, which I believe stands for Istanbul. It's a story of uh, an oud player who goes back to uh, present-day Istanbul to, to find some things. Uh, Nice little story, but 20 minutes, Eric's going to be there. He'll talk about the film. That's Thursday, September 26th, so that's the end of September. Um, also in September, Chevy Chase. We have a number of great volunteers who are working out of our Chevy Chase library. They picked up some of the slack uh, in programming out there. It's only open two days a week, but uh, in your packet, I've got a month a month of great programs. Uh, most of them come from that group. Uh, but they they uh, put together a youth film festival over the summer, probably the first of many, and they're going to show those films uh, done by kids from uh, first grade and up on September 21st. That's a Saturday afternoon. The following week on the 28th, the Theodore Payne Foundation is coming in. They're going to talk about wildflowers and nature and native plants. Uh, that should actually be a, a pretty good talk. They have good speakers. So that's the end of the month. Now, uh, you can't sign up for our mobile technology class in September because all the spots are filled. They were filled last week. Very popular. We just sent it out on, on Facebook and on the website and bang. Uh, two days of classes were, were filled, so we've added another one in October. So, you know, you can bring in your iPhone, your Android phone, any kind of tablet, and our staff will show you how to uh, use our mobile app, how to download ebooks, how to download e-music, how to get at a lot of our collection that is online that you can get uh, through an app on a tablet or a, or a phone. Um, and finally, uh, the month of September is traditionally in libraries uh, get your library card month. And so we're, we're kind of putting a, a twist on it. We want you to download our library app uh, in September. We want to see if we can get some, some numbers out of that. Um, you know, traditionally the, the library card is, is a symbol. You know, it's your passport, your portal to all these things you can find at a site. Well, the app is more than that. The app is your library. It's when you want it, it's right there in your hand 24-7. Um, on our app, uh, we have, let me see, we've got a number of channels. We just added a, a video channel, so you can pick up some of the GTV6 videos right there uh, real easy. We've, uh, we've got some good ones. We've got the Rose Float video, the Man's Inhumanity to Man, that was out at Brand Library, and the Life and Times of L.C. Brand. Um, let me see. You can, of course, look at your library account. You can reserve a book. You can place a hold on a book. If you're out, let's say, at some uh, place and you, you see an ISBN on a book or a CD, and you go, well, that's pretty good for that amount of money. Maybe maybe the library owns it, so you can you can take a picture with your your phone, just scan the barcode, and see if we own it. And if we do, you can put a hold on it. Um, you can download eBooks, uh, and you can even learn a language. Uh, we have a, a similar. You've probably seen the ads for um, a Rosetta Stone, a very expensive uh, uh, language learning program, use your computer. Uh, well, we have one uh, called Mango Languages. You can you set it up first on your computer, but after that you can use it on your mobile device. So you can, uh, you can get it 
right, right from your phone, your iPad, and they just added Eastern Armenian. Want to brush up on your uh, Armenian before you go traveling? That's a good place to go. So um, I, I encourage you. Uh, I guess I can check back next week to see how you did. But if, if you don't have it, uh, there's uh, just search Glendale Public Library in your in your app store, Android Play or or your Apple Store, and pick up our app. Oh, oh uh, uh, again, we're going to talk about this at all of our sites. We have iPads at all the sites. We're bolting them to many of our service desks. Uh, so we'll show you what to do right there. You can ask our staff about any of the channels in the app. We're really going to make an effort to uh, build up that clientele. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, none. It's just um, a little note on the, uh, Geraldine Saunders. She used to be a commissioner for a very short period of time with us. Uh, so. It would be very nice for us to go and see her back again. All right, very good. Thank you. Next item. Item four, oral communications. The discussion is limited to items not on this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. The commission may question or respond to the speaker, but there will be no debate or decision. The commission may refer the matter to city staff for investigation and report. And I have no cards. So uh, I think. I have no cards. Next item. item. Item 5, business agenda at 5A, information item at 1, report on zoning and arts. As the commission may recall, uh, during um, our work plan development process, um, one of the policy directives was to um, learn more about the um, zoning standards and regulations in relation to um, art uses. Staff from Community Development Department um, has prepared an informational report to present to you that will just give you an overview of some of the standards and incentives available to uh, these art-related uses. So um, um, I'm going to turn this over to Kristen Asp uh, with the Planning Department. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, Chair, members of the Commission. Um, I'm here to just sort of introduce uh, uh, zoning to you and uh, art uses as they relate to zoning. Um, I'll talk about how, how Glendale addresses art uses, and then I'll have uh, Mr. Loomis come up and cover certain areas like the downtown area and San Fernando Road um, that offer some incentive options as they relate to art uses. But first, I'd like to just sort of do a little zoning 101. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, how zoning works, but if you'll humor me, I'll just go through sort of the basics of what zoning is and, and how it's used by local governments. Um, its main purpose is it's a local tool to regulate land use or the activities that are occurring uh, in a city. It also, um, it also regulates the physical development of a city and it breaks down land into districts or zones like residential, commercial, industrial, mixed use. Uh, and the main reason for that is compatibility and promoting that. You know, for example, you wouldn't necessarily want your hazardous waste facility to be right next to your single family zone. So that's sort of the whole purpose of the breakdown of zones. Um, what zoning does not do or does not address is uh, safety as it relates to buildings and structures. Uh, those are regulated by building and fire codes. So while zoning can be very, very tailored to a specific city and is very different throughout the state, throughout the United States, um, building and fire codes are a little more of a national and state level and so those are more uniform that you find throughout the, throughout, um, the state and, and nationally. So how does Glendale and the Glendale Zoning Code address uh, art uses? They kind of fall into five major categories. Cultural art centers, museums, live work, retail, and theaters. These uses are generally permitted in commercial zones, mixed use zones, uh, and industrial districts. Uh, art galleries uh, is, a, is a common question we get and we consider that to be a general retail land use. And the reason we do that is because there is no real distinguishable difference between 
an art gallery and any other kind of retail establishment, the activity that is occurring uh, is very similar. Uh, same with theater uses. We do not make a distinction between a theater that shows a live performance versus that that has that's just showing a film. The same kind of activity of everybody showing up at generally the same time and leaving is no different between those two activities. Um, the live work land use is allowed in our downtown specific plan and along the San Fernando Road mixed use zone corridor. Um, that's intended for a workspace and incidental residential. Um, and the combination of, of live work can be a wide range of things from an accountant who also lives at his live work unit to a photographer that also lives there and has a gallery. And finally, all of these, all of our land uses, not just art, uh, art land uses, have a requirement for parking. So all of our categories are, are divvied up into different parking ratios. Um, where something like a theater will have a higher parking ratio versus a general retail use. So the kind of a simple zoning 101 and the more specific incentives um, with downtown specific plan and San Fernando Road, I'm going to turn over Mr. Lomas. Thank you. Thank you. As, as Kristen explained, we allow arts related uses in those five categories um, in all of our commercial and industrial and mixed use zones. As a matter of city policy since at least the past seven years and probably going back further before my time with the city, um, we have been tinkering with our zoning policies to encourage arts uses to cluster in the downtown. So the key mechanism for doing that is our downtown specific plan, which is a combination of policies, guidelines, and zoning standards. Um, and this is the vision statement out of it. And I'll just highlight there the word cultural was actually added um, to that vision statement by the Arts and Culture Commission. Um, and particularly, I believe Commissioner Gregorian insisted that we add that. <laughs> Good <day. laughs> um, Shortly after this specific plan was adopted, um, we began amending it to provide for uh, incentives for arts uses. And the first one was an incentive for new development to include museums, galleries, or exhibit space within um, the building envelope. So to take a back step, uh, every um, site within the downtown is eligible for height and density bonuses. So you, there's, you know, if your baseline height threshold is four stories, depending on if you provide certain public benefits like a hotel or affordable housing or additional public open space, the project may be eligible to go, say, to five stories and get a little extra density. When we amended the specific plan as it relates to museums and galleries, we said a new development that incorporates an exhibit space is eligible for one more floor, and basically the square footage of that gallery space is essentially free. It doesn't count towards their overall density requirements. Um, we basically not counted at all, so it's essentially free space. Um, the uh, obligation to utilize that incentive is that the proposed developer would need to enter into a development agreement with the city, which is the mechanism. A development agreement is a kind of legal tool between the city and a developer and, and an agreement uh, about how we're going to do things. That's the tool by which all the incentives in the downtown specific plan are enacted, so it's nothing new. Um, but in the case of the museums and galleries, what we would require of the developer, we would say, we as the city are going to give you, allow you to build this additional height, but we want you to present a five-year plan for how you're going to operate that gallery and that you're going to be committed to doing a certain number of events a year, a certain number of gallery showings, and that it will operate for, as a gallery for at least five years. The reason for doing that uh, is basically to ensure that we do have a gallery, that it's not a case where the developer builds a space, they have a gallery show, the day they open the building and six months later they say, the gallery's not working out, we're going to turn it into a Starbucks. So it's intended to make sure that that gallery use is actually operating. The other incentive we built in for existing spaces, um, for the conversion of existing spaces into arts, uh, into galleries or museums, is that basically we give a break on parking requirements. 
as Kristen said, art galleries are basically considered the same as retail spaces. So if somebody had a retail space on Brand Boulevard, they wanted to convert it into a gallery, there's no additional parking requirements because art galleries are considered retail. However, gallery spaces and museums require more parking than office use. So this incentive is particularly geared towards the idea of, say, the second floor of one of our office towers being converted into some sort of you know, boutique museum of some kind that wouldn't be burdened with providing the additional parking. Um, I will say at this point in time, none of the development or property owners in the downtown have even talked about trying to take advantage of these incentives. You know, it's really thought that it's going to be a developer who has a museum or an art gallery that they're, they're willing to sponsor um, would be the kind of developer to take advantage of this. Uh, the other incentive, and it's not exactly an incentive, but it's a matter of policy, is the Maryland Art and Entertainment District, which is the Maryland corridor between Harvard and Wilson. This is a few years ago, the redevelopment agency looked at this uh, two block stretch of road and said, we just lost Mervyn's, we've lost Circuit City, the movie theaters are closing, what do we do with this space? And the redevelopment staff looked at it and said, well, we don't think providing a lot more retail is the right answer. We've already got a lot of retail in downtown Glendale, but we don't have any nightlife and kind of cultural center. Let's focus those activities on Maryland. And it made sense because um, as you can see in this aerial perspective, we've got uh, the Alex Theater here in the top left and the Central Library down in the bottom, um, bottom right, sort of anchoring the two streets. So we sort of saw that there's sort of two existing civic cultural anchors that could sort of serve as the sort of, you know, sort of like the Galleria's got Target at one end and Macy's at the other. Um, a cultural center needs to have two strong anchors, and we already had those with existing city facilities. Um, so we sort of promoted this idea, and it's led to a series of public investments. The Alex Theater, as you may know, recently broke ground on their back-of-house expansion, which will allow the Alex Theater to continue to stay competitive amongst similar class theaters as they compete for symphonies and, and stage shows and the like. Um, so that's one civic investment that's resulted from it. I believe the commission is aware of the plan for renovating the Central Library. Um, a big component of that project is to uh, reorient the front door of the library to the north so that it would actually face Maryland, open up onto Harvard, and really be that anchor. So you see the bottom image is what the library looks today, and at the top is uh, actually some older rendering of the new front entrance. Um, and then it's also this policy or idea about this art and entertainment district has also led to a series of other investments, some private, some public, um, public partnerships. Um, so the Museum of Neon Art was brought in after we came up with this idea. So we have a museum anchor uh, coming into the district. Um, this is the passageway that will link to Central Park to the Americana and Brand Boulevard next to the, uh, the museum. And I particularly like this is intended to be a fountain right here, kind of water pool. And then this is a piece out of the museum's collection, this neon plumber sign that's going to drip water down into the pond and then the neon diver jumping off the building is diving into it. So it's a little architectural joke, if you will. <laughs> um, and then a completely private investment, the renovation of the old man uh, exchange theaters into the five-star cinema. This, my understanding, is it just opened this past weekend. Um, I think they've had a soft opening, so they're not really pushing it very hard, but I think you can buy tickets for movies there. Um, and then the other thing I would point out with this one is the sign right here, which as you can see, this is an LED, active LED sign, is really a kind of architectural metaphor for film strips. This was done under the Creative Sign Ordinance, which is something we adopted in conjunction with the Art and Entertainment District to encourage this kind of really inventive, artistic ways of doing signs. Uh, and then at the north end, the sort of behind the Alex Theater, is the Lemley Cinema Lofts. This is a mixed-use building that will incorporate five-screen Lemley Cinema. Um, it's been sort of stuck in the, the limbo that redevelopment, the end of redevelopment caused, but my understanding is that the development team is committed to moving this project forward. Um, so we've had the Art and Entertainment District spawned a whole series of different projects, which are now in the very beginning stages. The other thing we did with the Art and Entertainment District is we also adopted a new policy for that area um, if, for businesses that want to serve alcohol. Specifically, if you're a nightclub or a comedy club or even just a tavern or a restaurant, 
Under the old process, you'd be required to go through a conditional use permit and a public hearing to get your alcohol permit from the city. You'd still have to get one from ABC in the state. In the Art and Entertainment District, basically it's an administrative approval as a business operator. You agree to be licensed with the city as an operator, and then it's basically an over-the-counter permit. To, so we've expedited the process for nightclubs or comedy clubs or jazz clubs that want to serve alcohol to come to the district. And some restaurants have taken advantage of that program. And we've been ex slowly expanding that in the downtown. It now applies to mid-brand directly outside of the, in front of the Alex Theater as well. Um, the last sort of incentive where we began promoting kind of arts uses is what became known as the Creative Corridor. This is the San Fernando Road redevelopment area, which is basically all of San Fernando Road and adjacent properties from Burbank down to Los Angeles. And the intent of this initiative, uh, which was started by the redevelopment agency, was to leverage the presence of Disney and DreamWorks to try and bring creative industry to that corridor um, with the thought that you know, it could be additional film production, but it might also be uh, architecture and graphic designers, a whole variety of different industries fall under that term creative um, based on a series of studies that have been done by UCLA and USC. So we did an extensive inventory of the corridor and the businesses that were there, find out how many creative industries we actually had in the corridor. Turned out we have quite a few. Turns out a lot of them don't want to advertise they're there, actually. Um, you know, there are some businesses that are recording studios where very famous, popular, you know, rap stars or recording artists come to try out new guitars and they don't want the paparazzi to know they're there. So there's some unassuming storefronts that turn out have some really amazing recording studios in them and they have no interest in advertising that they um, even exist because of their, their client base. Um, but the agency convened a staff a task force to look at this area and determine what was the barriers towards creative industries moving into this corridor. It turned out first, to a large extent, it was about rebranding and advertising that we had this creative industry cluster in, in Glendale. Um, but then it turned out, in fact, it was actually um, rent and the lack of available space was the main issue preventing businesses from moving into the corridor. As Kristen said, we have live-work zoning in this area. We have mixed-use zoning. Every creative business can move into here. It's just there actually isn't a lot of vacancy. And when you can find it, sometimes it's very difficult to convert spaces um, from an old warehouse space into, say, a recording studio. So the agency uh, had developed a series of incentives. Um, there was a small financial incentive for creative industry to be able to rehab spaces. Um, and this was, sadly, one of the last acts that the redevelopment agency did before the state eliminated them. <laughs> so nobody actually got to take advantage of this program. <laughs> um, and we don't have the funds to sort of reinstate it. Um, what we do offer in both the downtown and San Fernando Road is what we call our entitlement concierge service, which is a very fancy way of saying we're very, very high touch um, when developers come to town to one of these two project areas and they say we want to open this kind of business. We assign very dedicated staff to them that basically work them from the very beginning when they walk in the door until they get their building permits and sometimes beyond to resolve issues that come up between the fire department or the building and safety division planning issues, really walk them through the process if they need to get certain kind of parking exceptions, really help them go through that process um, in a pretty expedited manner. Um, and I would at this point say our entitlement concierge service is probably second to none in LA County in terms of our ability to get businesses open in a short period. Um, so that's really the major incentive that we offer is, time, as everybody knows, time is money and we try to make that time frame for developers as short as possible. So with that, that concludes our informational presentation on the incentives we have uh, related to arts uses and zoning. And obviously, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, questions from commissioners, comments? I mean, I'd like to just let the commission know if there's a specific area that you may want to discuss. We can schedule that um, later um, um, after uh, the work plan is approved by the council and we work our way through some of the other priority projects. Um, that would, of course, require coordination with the community development department since this is their area of expertise. So, um, so we would have to take that into consideration and their scheduling and timing. But um, if there is a specific area of focus, we can look to schedule a discussion on that later in the fall or early next year. 
Uh, if I may, Commissioner or Chair. Um, one last thing I forgot to add is the nature, the process for amending the zoning code or the downtown specific plan. It can be done in two different ways. One, an applicant has a piece of property or their entitlement on a piece of property and they make a request to change the zoning in a certain fashion. Um, a, a good example of how you'd see that is in historic districts where the neighbors, the residents, or actually the property owners of a proposed historic district petition the city to say, please change the zoning of our neighborhood to historic district status. Um, the other process by which zoning code amendments can be made is at the direction of city council. So if there was an interest by a commission, even the planning commission in making a change to the zoning, they would have to forward their request to the city council and the city council would say, yes, let's initiate that change. Um, I actually have a, a question. So um, with regard to the density bonus, is uh, the sale of, of that also an opportunity? So as opposed to just a, a developer saying, if I put in a gallery downstairs, um, you'll let me build higher. Is there a possibility if there is another development um, where a gallery space is going someplace else that has um, some air rights or density rights that they're not taking advantage of, that there could be some sort of swap in there? Um, the way we, we would refer to that is transfer of development rights and planning lingo. Um, and we do not have a mechanism at this point in time for transfer of development rights through the downtown. <coughs> Am I correct, Kristen? Or, or anywhere in the city, no. Okay. And is there, has that been brought up before and not gone through, or what's the background on that? Uh, you know, I think transfer development rights in the, within the downtown, uh, I believe, was raised a number of years ago, and I forget on what context, whether it was the downtown specific plan advisory committee or maybe by a council member at some later date or even by a commission. I, I don't remember who brought that up. I know it was brought up, I would say, at least five years ago. Um, okay. It's not something we've kind of, that we've looked into. Um, my, my other question I had was, um, so with regard to all these incentives that are on the books that haven't been particularly fruitful, and, and I understand that the package, the incentive package went in right before redevelopment went down and there wasn't funding for some of those mechanisms. Is that essential, that was, in, that was intended to help um, bring more users of the, uh, of the, the zoning? That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, in the case of the San Fernando Road, the financial package was intended to be an incentive to help the creative industries convert old warehouse space into whatever creative industry mm -hmm. space they needed. Um, oftentimes, it was a case where it was a need to put in you know, a fire sprinkler system. An older building didn't have it, but if you're going to inhabit it with some sort of office or pottery studios where you got kilns, you need to have a fire sprinkler and bring it up to current code. That's pretty expensive. So that financial package was intended to help with those kinds of conversions. Um, so the lack of the financial incentive being there, is, do you see that as being one of the largest issues in terms of, of these incentives being useful or, or attracting more creative uses? You know, I, d I couldn't exactly speak to what's happening on San Fernando Road in terms of creative industry kind of trying to show up uh, or locate space. Um, my understanding is it's, it's really the lack of vacancies. There just there isn't the vacancy rate on San Fernando Road is very very small. Um. I think last time I uh, heard from economic development staff, the vacancy rate is less than two percent. Um, so there's absolutely no space. So um, even if somebody was dying to get into uh, the San Fernando Road corridor, there really isn't a space for them to come in, and that's what um, that staff had mentioned. And, there, and it's, it's, the vacancy rate is it, kind of weird to ask the way to ask it, but it, it, they're actively being used as opposed to just not uh, highest and best use essentially in, in that area. Or I, I'm, just, I'm curious to how much is being sat on in terms of investment and how much is moving actively being used in a more open way. Yeah, that's, that's a hard question to answer. Um, you know, what we hear from the brokerage community is that they oftentimes don't even need to advertise space because there is such a high demand that kind of got a backlist of people <laughs> so they don't, they just bring people in and it doesn't even make it onto a real estate listing sometimes. Um, I think there are some, there are definitely spaces on San Fernando Road that are not being used to their highest and best use um, because there's also a lot of long-term property owners in the, in the corridor um, that have, you know, uses that are willing to pay rents that 
bring in the money that they're interested in seeing. So they're not sort of actively pursuing new tenants. They've got long leases. There's no reason for them to try and change tenants. Mm -hmm. um, and my last kind of general question is, has the, the department, um, even since redevelopment, considered an initiative that's proactive in terms of bringing in arts uses as opposed to waiting for people to learn about the incentives and then create something? So. Um, you know, f actively finding the partnerships or actively going after um, any kind of outside funding that brings in both private and public um, investment to activate a particular initiative and to this end. Yeah, I, th I think um, the economic development staff has been pretty proactive in chasing particular kind of tenants. I know since the adoption of the Creative Corridor policy, they've been very active in trying to recruit creative industry to Glendale. Um, and as regards to the Art and Entertainment District, I know that they're also pretty active in trying to find the right uses for that area. Uh, you know, and there are sometimes just unusual things pop up where, you know, we found a couple of months ago there was a comedy club that was interested in locating in the downtown. So we're trying to find the right space that, one, is affordable to them, two, is the right space and meets the city's goals. Um, you know, and oftentimes those conversations don't lead to a new business. It, I would guess probably the majority of them do not, but they are pretty active in trying to, they chase down every lead they get. And sort of whisper to them, oh, I heard about this cool group up <laughs> or something somewhere over in Alhambra, you know, they're on it. Really. Um, and I lied, I have another question. So, um, has, and I don't know if this is through your department or for staff, if this would be through a different department, but has there been ever any conversation about giving incentives um, to developers in terms of their space um, in return for the use of local artists or local creative businesses. So like the creative signage, for instance, um, you know, they, that, that policy or piece is in there. But I, I'm wondering about like finding ways of being able to use local um, artists and designers and, and such in development projects and if there's any incentive for them to, to do that. And, and actually, for, on a, for the staff question, I guess this is probably a different department, but thinking about permits um, where people are needing to um, have a permit for space, a permit for an event, and having some sort of incentive where if they use local um, uh, caterers and local uh, musicians and such, that they might have some sort of break on that, essentially. And it, 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 when we're talking about incentives, that just comes to mind, and I might be two different departments, but is that, has that come up at all? Um, I'm not, um, it hasn't come up uh, to my knowledge. I can check in um, with some of the other departments and find out if there is such an incentive for using local vendors or artists um, because that would encompass, I think, a couple of different departments and then I can just give you an update as to if that is something we are incorporating or not and if you want to discuss it in the future, we can't. Okay. Could I ask a question? In such a situation, which department do you think would be in charge of making sure that we are using our artists and our vendors and et cetera? Is there a department that already does that or it's a new assignment for a department? How does it work? I think licensing and permitting is all done through the licensing and permitting unit of community development and housing. So um, that's the department that oversees it. So again, I would have to look and see if they do have any incentives and what those are, if any. And the other question is that if any organization or any group, uh, they use one of our locations for their exhibitions and for their purposes, is there such an incentive as the city matching in kind or providing the lighting or the hanging for the fixtures and etc.? Because in the previous, in the past, I know that there has been a situation that after that was done and the event was over, the lighting and everything went down the drain and it was discarded and not used. I just wanted to see if there is a department that we can be in touch to make sure that if as an incentive anything is being put or any other negotiation, uh, those fixtures and whatever could be used by our artists in the future could stay there 
and uh, or there would it would be discussed to see if there's a further use for them before they are being discarded because I was in touch with a department and we had a communication over one of the locations as such just it would be such a waste I would like to make sure that we do the best in whatever city provides or installs stays there after the event as well so we could use it for other uses that would cut some of the expenses that we need to have in the future for artists any other questions? Just a wonderful report, by the way. Very informative, fantastic report. Thank you. Just may I ask, Patricia, where yeah. does it start, the San Fernando corridor, and where does it end? Just the city lines, exactly, or? Uh, yes, I will. Um, if on this map, this is San Fernando Road. Yes. This is the 134 and the 5. So this is the Burbank border. This is down in Los Angeles. Is it near uh, two freeway all the way down to Los Angeles or before? No, it stops before. Um, basically, just past Brand Boulevard where Sealy's furniture okay. store used to be. It's about another four or five parcels, basically one more block, and okay. then you reach the LA City okay. limit. So it's everything that's between San Fernando Road and the railroad tracks. Most of this is owned or controlled by Disney and DreamWorks mm -hmm. for their development. And then there's two little fingers that sort of stretch out from the San Fernando Road. This is Broadway and Colorado going up to Columbus, which is basically, as you know, the parking structure for the Galleria. And okay. then you enter into the downtown specifically. One point. more question. Have you considered just outdoor exhibition uh, areas? I don't know. It could be on a public property or a bus stop. I don't know. Uh, something that a train rider might see on its way all the way passing through Glendale. It doesn't necessarily need to be a building or lighting, but it could be something very simple, but it will define us as a city of art. So we can start from the bottom, from Los Angeles, going through San Fernando, a driver, let's say, he's in traffic, but he can enjoy art as he's driving through Glendale. That might be less expensive, less, more affordable to achieve, instead of having space and all the permits, all those, uh, zoning. I, I just want to you consider something like that it might be helpful for us. You know, we, we did we, a number of years ago. We s did a, a sign program, wayfinding signs throughout the whole city. So you know, like when you turn on the street, it's yes. say you know Brand Boulevard that way, downtown this way. Um, and one of the key recommendations out of that study was to develop gateway signs. Um, so you do know when you've arrived in Glendale. I yes, think yes. the only one we really have is the one on Glen Oaks that we share with Burbank. Um, that was a program that was going to be funded by redevelopment. <laughs> um, but what we are looking at, we do have a grant through um, Metro Transit Authority to look at this area around the San Fernando Road, uh, the Larry Zarian Glendale Transit Center, where the Amtrak Metrolink yes. station is. Um, so we've been looking at gateway opportunities there. And we think that uh, both Los Feliz and Brand Boulevard, as it dives under the track, there's some amazing opportunities for uh, some sort of unique gateway feature there that probably is going to be some form of public art. Okay. I'd like to continue that conversation because uh, from the commission level we've been discussing that in terms of our mural program that we'll be putting forward and some other public art opportunities so and, uh, we would like to continue to be hear about updates from your end and, and inform vice versa through staff. Yeah, we've actually had two walking tours with completely unrelated groups in that area, and both of them said when they saw Los Feliz, this would be a great place for a mural. <laughs> I was like, funny you mentioned that. <laughs> well, I just stick it. We didn't even know it. Oh, sorry. Commissioner Dr. Um Artists usually ask this. Some are aware and some don't have the information. As far as the Sealy's goes, the building, do we have any control over it? I mean, does the city have any control? How does that work? Because it's a wonderful location for exhibitions, and it was actually used by uh, different artists as their workshop or for their exhibition purposes. Uh, if it is under the, a contract or understanding with the city, what are the how, how does one get to use those facilities? Um, well, basically, the Sealy's facility is completely privately owned. They don't have any agreements with the city um, at all. So we don't have any lever to sort of ask them to open their doors for a specific kind of use. Um, unlike some developments where we do have an agreement with them, we do have some you know, opportunity to ask them to do certain things in, in conjunction with that agreement. But Sealy's, as most buildings are, is 100% privately owned and operated. 
Thank you very much, because it, it has, it has a, a nice opportunity. It provides all these kind of uh, rooms or areas that one has for exhibition, and etc. So artists should contact the private owners in that case. Right, yeah, it's, okay. it's for lease creative office space. Thank you. Commissioner Lee? As for the Sealy building, I think it, I read somewhere that they wanted was up for sale. What's happening with that? Um, the developer owns a variety of creative office spaces throughout LA County, mostly in the city of LA. Um, and they seem to be undergoing some financial problems. Each one of their buildings is, has a separate operating company. Each one of those operating companies seems to be going into bankruptcy protection. Hmm. So they must be having trouble paying back their lenders. But I haven't heard since they went into bankruptcy if they've emerged, but that was only a few months ago. So. Okay, that, that was what I was wondering. And if not, do we have funding? We can go buy the building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not in bankruptcy with any loans they own us, so unfortunately we can't put our hands in it. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you very Good. much. Appreciate it. Um, we do have one public comment. I'd like to invite um, Mr. Gregorian on this item. Good afternoon again. Um, the presentation by Mr. Lewis and Ms. Uh, Kristen Asp Aspen was, was great. And uh, we can see that um, in the past several years, we have come a very, very long way. Um, as Mr. Lewis uh, correctly said, uh, we worked very closely together to even include arts and culture in the downtown specific plan. And um, we see the results of it now. It's a little slow. It's a city bureaucracy problem, I understand. But we, we see a lot of good results. And since the commission was transferred from uh, the uh, Parks and Rec Department to the Library and Arts and Culture Department, and with the leadership of Ms. Cleary and Annette Vartanian, we see a lot of improvement in our plans, in you know, everything that we want to go forward. And I think um, you know, since uh, almost 11, 12 years ago, when I was first appointed at the commission, I, I do see a lot of improvement. Um, and I congratulate the city for doing what is right for our community and for arts and culture. However, I think there is a lot to be done. And one of the things that uh, Mr. Lumis correctly explained was the um, uh, land use issues and where you know, the, the different zoning uh, affects the decision on a particular project or building to go on that area. Um, I believe that we should form a committee comprised of uh, the community development department, maybe a, a, a planning commissioner, maybe an arts and culture commissioner, and some community members um, and the staff to um, assess and study the um, effects of what, what if we kind of have a zoning designation for buildings and residential buildings for artists and art uses. Um, I know that the city, uh, and I'm not quite sure if it's the community development department or not, but I know it's the housing, which comes probably under that same department. Um, they have, let's say, projects for low income ha uh, housing or mo moderate income housing. What if we have a zone or areas designated for low income artists? for artists who really will need that kind of financial help uh, and workspace so that they can create and not be really burdened by the um, overwhelming economic uh, uh, stresses that they go through. So um, although we have made a lot, lot of uh, inroads into this situation, but I think it is important that we do study uh, and try to enact some guidelines where the city staff would know how to uh, approach, let's say, a developer who wants to build a housing project art-related on, let's say, the San Fernando Creative Corridor or, or anywhere in, in Glendale, not necessarily on some of these areas designated, like downtown specific uh, plan area or the other areas. So um, if we are really serious about arts, and promoting arts and culture in Glendale, we also have to support artists and their work. And 
I believe, a specific, and which can be overlaid zoning. It doesn't have to be a specific zone and only designated for that zoning, but maybe kind of an overlay zone created by proper studies of all the appropriate bodies and people so that if any pro developer who wants to come forward and propose something, then the staff will know how to handle it. Right now, we don't have that. I mean, I, I know that there is an artist colony in Burbank, which, is, which works apparently fine, and it's just probably a one building. And I know that other areas do that, but let's be the leaders. Let's get into this, and let's create that zoning for arts and artists and art activities. And my proposal is to have this ad hoc committee to study and research and recommend. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I, any question? Great idea. Um, I, I actually would like to um, ask staff in, in a future meeting if we could look at any existing overlay or what the process is on an overlay zoning um, and how that interplays. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Next item. Sorry. If I may. Backing off the next item. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I may, actually, one of um, the incentives that's not related to zoning but is related to housing policy, which does fall under community development, um, is affordable housing. And under the affordable housing laws, you can give preference to artists. Um, I'm not exactly sure how you demonstrate that you are an artist, um, but the housing authority uh, has expressed an interest recently in, in having promoting artist housing. One particular project that was originally going to have a preference for artists, um, that project fell through um, from the developer side, so the Housing Authority backed out of that deal. Um, as the project got revised and different funding sources, the preference now goes to veterans. Um, but it is something the Housing Authority does look at and does entertain it's affordable housing with a preference for artists. And then there's some sort of requirement, I believe, that those units, as they turn over, continue to be utilized by artists. Indeed. And um, so a second piece to for staff, if um, in a future meeting, if we could have some additional information about the use, uh, the potential development of affordable artist housing and what that would entail, I think some additional information about that preference and the affordable housing laws would be um, helpful to the commission. All right, thank you. Next item. <clears throat> At 5B, action items. At 1, appointment of liaison to Glendale Arts Board of Directors. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, today, um, we would, uh, the commission um, um, is asked to appoint a new liaison to the Glendale Arts Board as the past appointee, appointee uh, Rosmic Gregorian, has vacated his seat. Um, essentially, the um, Glendale Arts Board of Directors uh, meets every other month at noon starting um, December 10th. They meet in the um, Glendale Arts Conference Room. Um, and uh, just to give you, uh, remind you of the uh, background, uh, based on the Glendale Arts Bylaws, the commission liaison is not considered a member of the board, um, and his or her participation is not counted toward a quorum. Rather, their role is for information gathering and presentation only. It's to maintain that partnership with, um, with one of um, the um, organizations in the community. Um, although uh, the commission liaison won't be a voting member, it's desi desirable that the appointee takes an active role in discussions. And of course, Glendale Arts does a lot of programming and the commission is doing a lot of programming. Um, so it's expected that the appointee go to the meetings and have an active role. Um, so the motion uh, before you is to appoint a new liaison um, to serve um, um, on the Glendale Arts Board. Could I ask a question? At what time do they get together? Is, is it still 7 in the morning? No, they meet every other month at noon starting September 10th. So it's lunchtime meeting. Um, um, I well, my, I, before we continue with comments, just one question. When we, will this be a, a self, self or, or other nomination? On, I'm just curious about the process of appointing. Can someone self-nominate or, or, or nominate somebody? Thank you. Um, 
So what, did we have a question? The, the procedure prior to this, it was that people who were interested, they would, you know, uh, so nominate fun. themselves, and then we would take a vote on uh, if we would like we would think that that person would be. Uh, okay, I was just wanted to clarify whether someone could self-nominate or for. You can just order. draw straws. <laughs> or we just appoint. <laughs> um, did, was there a yes, question? Yes, I, I did have a question. Commissioner uh, Kavanian. Are the dates already set for the meetings? I apologize. So uh, the date, um, um, it, the dates are set. Um, so I can um, provide those dates. Um, once uh, they are confirmed by the Glendale Arts Board. Are, so the first meeting is going to be September 10th, and they are meeting every other month, but that particular day I will give you uh, the, a year's or worth of dates okay. after the um, appointee is selected. Because I, I would like to express my interest in uh, serving as the liaison, but uh, barring the dates, of course. That's, uh, is there a specific day of the week that they usually meet, or is it just... Sorry, I'm, I know I don't mean to put Steph on the spot, but <laughs> um, no, I don't have that information. But um, you know, I'd like to assume that it is going to be the same date every other month. Okay. Um, so um, I'm trying to think. September 10th is perhaps a Wednesday. Might be the second Wednesday of the month. I'm just probably. I think it's a Tuesday if my math. Or Tuesday, me but we can confirm those details um, if you are interested, and then give you uh, the agenda. But again, it is every other month, so um, it's not a monthly meeting. Other other interest, other nomination. Uh, I would have liked to say that if uh, Commissioner Kevanian is interested to take that role. Uh, it would be very appropriate because um, being a conductor and a musician and very involved with uh, uh, different uh, aspects of the presentations at the Alex Theater, he, he would be a very good liaison. It's just putting a good word for it. We all know his capacity, but just uh, he would be a very good uh, liaison for the Glendale Arts. So I'm looking. I second that nomination. <laughs> <laughs> I will accept the nomination. You accept that nomination? <laughs> Can we have a roll call? And the, to confirm, September 10th is a Tuesday. Right. I need a, I need a, a motion to um, for the appointment of Commissioner Kevanian as the liaison to the to Glendale Arts. I will make that motion. Okay, and I'll second it. Roll call, please. Commissioner Jehovanesian? Yes. Kevanian? Yes. Lee? Yes. Chirikian? Yes. Chairperson Deaver? Yes. Congratulations. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and don't come back next month and say, oh. Yeah, no. I, <laughs> September 10th, I can do for sure. Excellent. So. Next item. At 5B. At 5B2, approval of draft request for qualifications for consultant for feasibility study. Um, and, and our ongoing discussions in developing our arts and cultural plan, as well as our two-year work plan, um, one of the um, items that has been a priority for the commission is a need for space that could be rented by artists, artist groups, and organizations. Um, this has also been requested by artists and art organizations in our community. Um, at our last month's meeting, um, the commission um, uh, voted to uh, move forward with a feasibility study um, to hire a consultant um, to look at options for a community gallery or exhibition facility. So today, um, I'll go through the process, um, what an RFQ is, what we're looking for in a consultant or a firm, how we will be reviewing the proposals, and then ultimately what the next steps are. Um, I just want to remind you that you are approving um, the draft RFQ pending the um, final approval of the work plan by the council. So um, although we approve it, there might be um, changes that are made by the council when um, the work plan is presented to them. So um, when we discussed uh, the uh, goals of um, the um, of what uh, type of a space was needed, I've also uh, took a lot of the uh, comments and considerations from the commission. We really developed goals of a feasibility study. Uh, the most important being is whether a new community gallery exhibition multi-use multi fa facility is feasible in our community. Um, that was something that the commission thought was important. If we build something, is it really going to be sustainable for the long term for 
for the most number of artists and arts organizations and for the most types of uses. Um, so that is a lot to, to look at. Of, um, the other is to identify the appropriate size and location of the facility. We want to pick a location and make sure that it is a size that um, you know enough um, organizations and artists will want to uh, take advantage of the space um, and that um, we will be able to recuperate the costs. Also to provide estimates of the capital and operating costs, uh, we really need to understand how a space like this functions, how much it really costs um, to not only build it or put in the infrastructure, but to maintain it for the long term. Um, and of course something else is to maximize the revenues or the partnerships to be able to fund those ongoing um, operations. The last thing that um, you know I think the Commission wants to do is to really invest in a facility but not really have a plan for how it's going to um, sustain itself. And then um, finally it's uh, to identify a development or operational partner as appropriate. Um, there are a lot of community organizations and artists or that uh, would really be a great Great partner in making sure that this, um, you know, facility is run um, and operated um, um, in the best possible way, and so that it does um, maintain um, for the long um, term. Um, so, um, a couple of months ago, if you recall, I went over the differences between a call for artists, request for proposals, request for qualifications, and what each um, um, entails. So, just to give you a quick. Uh, review. Essentially an RFQ is an open invitation to allow consultants or fir uh, firms to submit an official statement of interest and qualifications. Um, th in this case it's for a feasibility study for a community gallery exhibition facility. We want to know who uh, is an expert in doing a feasibility study for a project of this type and those are the only, um, you know, resumes or uh, proposals that we want to receive, the consultant that we ultimately retain, we want to make sure that this is their expertise and they really know what they're doing. And essentially what it allows us to obtain information to select the best qualified firm. Again, it's a really a niche um, feasibility study and we want to find the best and um, the Ultimately, the product is develop, uh, delivered at the end of the assignment. Sometimes, with a you know call for artists, you're getting you know you ask for proposals for you know um, an animated mural on Los Feliz Boulevard underpass, and when you know you're in an RFP or call for artists, you are given that exact um, product. But with an RFQ, you're trying to find that best consultant or firm to be able to deliver the best possible product at the end of um, the scope of services. Now, uh, the uh, scope of services, this is what the consultant or the firm is going to be asked to undertake. Um, so um, this is, um, you know, we've narrowed this down, or I've uh, narrowed this down to really get us the best possible report or a feasibility study to be uh, used for a potential business plan should the commission choose to move forward. Um, essentially, uh, the project orientation and initial field work means, um, you know, staff, the commission giving background information, giving the information, for example, that was presented today um, on some of the zoning incentives we have, give information on the lower level of the civic auditorium, but also put the consultant in touch with local artists and organizations to hear from them what their needs are in this community. So it's really about blending what the commission really wants to see, what the, ultimately the council wants to see in a facility, but also what the community wants to see in a facility. And the consultant is really the expert who is able to measure all of those uh, needs together. The second is to identify the key demands. You know, what are the demands locally in our community, but also beyond um, beyond Glendale? Are there is there such a huge need that we would be able to um, you know build out even a bigger facility, or does it need to be smaller? But it also um, would also they would also look at growth prospects. You know, if we start at you know at one point, will we be able to see um, you know an increase in the usage? And then also to look at Glendale's demographics and the economics, you know, can people really afford to pay and use a facility like this? Another uh, component is to look at um, similar galleries or facilities in the region to see what they're doing, what they're not doing, how much are they charging, how big are they, how small are they, and just really understanding uh, what makes up all of those spaces. And then to find out the demand for the type of use. Um, of course, um, it's basic economics is you want to build something if there's a demand for it and really be able to build something that will um, appeal to the largest number of artists and artist organizations for the longest amount of time. 
And um, the financial projections, again, is how much uh, revenue do we anticipate generating from a facility to cover these operations? How much would a facility like this need to charge? And again, the consultant is going to be tasked with figuring out what those rates are so that we don't charge so high that nobody can rent out a facility, and, but to charge enough so that the facility can be self-sustained. And um, finally is really um, how much is um, it going to cost to do the capital improvements to, for example, to turn a space from, you know, civic auditorium or a retail space or an office into a multi-use um, exhibition facility. And the selection criteria, as I mentioned, is again finding the most experienced consultant or firm that has done studies like this. So we're really going to be looking for and asking for, um, you know, information on, you know, how many uh, similar studies has a consultant done? What's the quality of their work? Um, do they have good references? Is it even a study we've heard of? Uh, if they only have, uh, you know, resume of things that never happened because the quality wasn't good of the of the final product, then that um, is a red flag. Qualifications of the team members assigned to a project, um, you know, the quality and the clarity of the proposal and the presentation, do they understand what we need from them? That's something else that we look for. Um, the total cost for, uh, for them delivering that uh, product to us and does the way that they've broken down the cost for the work that they're doing, does it make sense um, or are they, you know, charging us a lot more than other consultants have projected? Um, their ability and capacity to complete uh, the project within budget and required timeline. Of course, these are things that we would look in. We do reference checks, you know, are they, uh, you know, consistently late and over budget on um, similar project or are they really great? And of course, we want um, a, a consultant or a firm that's going to work well with the city team as well as in the community. We don't want to just bring somebody um, in um, that really isn't going to understand the dynamics of our community, especially since this is supposed to be a community facility and they're going to be doing a lot of community outreach too. Uh, the RFQ process, um, ultimately this is like very, very simplified. It's a little bit more uh, complex, but I really wanted to give you a snapshot. Essentially, um, in September, the council uh, will review and uh, approve the two-year work plan, and this includes this feasibility study in the RFQ. Um, so should they um, approve with no changes, um, then uh, staff will issue the RFQ for formal responses. Since you are uh, approving a document today, or if you choose to approve the document, it'll be ready to go as soon as council approves the work plan. Um, generally allow one month for proposal submissions. Um, after that one month, um, a, a, a team will review the responses and um, the consultant is um, selected and then we can begin the scope of work. Um, something that we can add is really to assign a deadline for the report. So if we want to um, require that once the consultant is selected that they deliver the final product within four months I think is really reasonable. And something else we can do is, you know, they can provide us a, a midpoint update um, before they begin to finalize, um, you know, some of those um, so those details. And then um, essentially the, the report and the final study is presented to the commission. And at that point, you can uh, decide, you know, did it, it determine that, uh, you know, a, a, a facility like this is feasible in Glendale? Um, if it is, you know, you can use that information to then uh, develop a, a business plan to be able to present to council for the, uh, for the capital improvements to enhance the space. Um, I would like to ask you a question. Um, for the selection of the consultant, would one of the commissioners be on that team that we are selecting the uh, consultant or it's not uh, considered that? So far, um, that's not something um, you know we've discussed yet. If the commission would like to appoint one commissioner to to look at the proposals, you can do so. Um, it shouldn't be a conflict of interest. I'm looking at Mike to make sure that it's fine. So um, you know, um, I would be reviewing the the proposals along with um, you know if you would choose to appoint a commissioner or a community member. Uh, yeah, I'd actually like to allow staff to complete their. Before Thank you. Are we discussing or? No, not no. yet. Sorry. Yeah. Um, no, I just wanted to say essentially uh, this concludes my presentation. I wanted to let you know that we did receive comments from the Glendale Art Association regarding um, the RFQ. Um, it has been distributed. It is going to be part of the official um, record for this this report. And um, if uh, 
If you have questions, um, I'll open it to the commission um, to ask questions. Um, I want to go back to Commissioner Shurkin. Did you have a? Um, what refers to the feasible study uh, person or company? Uh, can we make recommendations? What kind of group we would like to see in that in that uh, committee or the company? For example, I would like to see somebody a reporter from Glendale area to be in that committee. Also a, a community art leader from the community member to be part of that feasible study group because each one will have its input because sometimes when you're doing a study and look an area for art gallery but you might see something different there and that will help us in the future plan. I mean, we're doing a feasible study specifically for gallery exhibition but we might come up with some other stuff that it will be better for us to lean and change a little bit. Um, I would like to see at least four different type of a profession, a reporter, a developer, community art leader, and a commissioner in that group where they're doing that study so they can have their uh, ideas and uh, inputs there. Okay, I will include that. Um, um, that's completely appropriate to, to ask. Um, I ask that uh, you can email recommendations. Um, and if I understand correctly, these are individuals uh, with whom the consultant will meet with. Okay, I just okay, uh, wanted yes, to, okay. Yes. Um, to just stay on track today, I would say, uh, if you have ideas for people that could uh, meet with a consultant once they're selected, that we wait until the next meeting, because I really want to focus okay. specifically on the RFQ, because I know that there, um, you know, you have some ideas, some of the other commissioners may not have an exact idea, and I really want to make sure that we spend more time identifying the right um, people and community groups uh, with whom the consultant will meet after the fact. So, Thank you. I have another question. Have an um, the, just it's any for information, because, you know, you have done this with the planning department and et cetera. You're well informed in that area. Let's say if um, the location chosen um, is a city-owned location, since it is already being taken care of uh, the expenses by a department that is in charge of that location, for example, it's Parks and Rec or whatever. So already, because that is supposed to be maintained, so part of the maintenance fees would be covered by the department as is, isn't it correct? That's what the consultant will determine. Right now, for example, if you want to take the example, uh, let's say the, the gas station facility um, at Adams Square is identified. Uh, the Parks Department is maintaining that as, um, as a parks, almost a, a miniature community center, which has completely different maintenance requirements than a multi-use exhibition facility. So the uh, consultant will have to do, uh, uh, will have to look at those economics. It's really, if we completely change the use, and it's no longer being used, let's say, as, um, as a smaller community center. Well, it's now being used as something very different, and if it's being operated by a completely different department, then you know, the former department will not uh, have to pay the fees, or if it is gonna be multi-use where it can be used by multiple departments, that consultant will be able to say, well, this much of the percentage you know, can be covered by existing maintenance costs, and then the rest we will need to recover. So these are all the little things that you you. Know, a, a, a consultant will look at. Uh, so in that case, again, enlighten me. Truly, I really want to learn about uh, this stuff. So in that case, a place like the Civic Auditorium or the Pacific Center that we have, uh, since it's already a, it's part of, it is a city location and it is already being maintained, how could any private other location compete with that which is not already owned? You know, they can, the ownership can change or uh, the existence of the location the fees and expenses, how could that compete with something that, that is already has to be maintained by the city? Yeah, I don't know if I'm putting it right. No, you're make, uh, uh, I, I completely understand you make a good point. And again, the, the consultant will, will identify that, will identify if it's a city-owned facility, for example, you know, the maintenance is going to cost a certain amount of money because there is already existing maintenance that takes place, or we're going to have to replace 100% of that maintenance um, services that are provided and then compare that to a private facility. So again, um, the, the consultant really looks at all of these analytics and then provides the best recommendations. So you may save on maintenance costs, but the capital improvements might be more expensive in a city-owned facility, but, you know, 
almost uh, non-existent for a private facility, and then you have to then compare those costs, the, the, the direct capital improvement costs, and then some of the soft costs and for the maintenance. So again, that the report will provide that information for you. Now, the third part, for the capital improvement part. Um, if it's a private organization, let's say, uh, whatever money is spent after a while, if I own that location, I would decide that I want to tear it down and build a big apartment building and make a lot of money out of it or whatever. But with the city, it's already kind of more permanent in that sense. Is, is that how it works or it doesn't? If we were to enter um, into an agreement with um, Private. A private entity, it would require an agreement to make sure that any investment we would make is not going to be, you know, um, uh, destroyed or sold off without the city's knowledge. So I think that's going to come after the feasibility study, is if we want to pursue that partnership or if the city just wants to do something in its own facility. Thank you. Those are my concerns. Thank you very much. Commissioner Lee. I was wondering to put in there the... Uh uh, up, uh, when they're updating the report to us, can they come to our commission? Yes. And give us an update. This way we can at least understand and see if they're on the right track, what we're looking for, before Absolutely. we just get the end result. Absolutely. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Kevanya. Um In reading this, it, uh, I, I'm a little bit... Uh, confused uh, because I I see seven, se several um, points of pigeonholing ourselves in this. What I want to warn the community is that this this report may come back and not recommend to us that we should have. And I'm reading um, from the last line of the summary here of the first paragraph uh, a space that would serve as a community gallery and exhibition facility. They may come back to us and possibly tell us to do something else. Is that is that correct? Okay. So, I, I or or maybe um, suggest that a, a space that is not rentable for artists, for example, um, if it's a community gallery, uh, it may not be rented. It may just be simply given, for example. So, am I correct in assuming that whatever is said in that summary paragraph is not set in stone? Am I correct in assuming I mean, that? essentially, I mean, this feasibility study doesn't promise a facility or a, a promise to build something. What it does is it tells the commission and the city is what's really feasible in this community. We've identified, you know, um, a community gallery multi-use exhibition facility. So the multi-use exhibition facility, I think, uh, leaves more room for opportunity so we can, you know, uh, use that term uh, should you want. And then they can say, well, a multi-use facility may not work. It should only be a specific type of a use, and this is the, the recommendation. Or they may say, nothing like this is feasible in Glendale. Although there is a little bit of demand, there is so many facilities and uh, surrounding communities that it's not going to be sustainable. Right. So the Which is why I brought that up, because I would much rather I would much rather prefer the terms multi-use art exhibiting space than specifically writing in because at the end of the day the person who's going to be uh, responding to this uh, RFQ is going to be reading this and I don't want that to be pigeon spaced for them I want to if we're going to explore all the options let's explore all the options and not just call it you know a space that could be rented by artists art art groups or organizations or call it a community gallery. That I think that's that's pigeonholing us. So I, I, I want to use general terminology for that, so like we, multi. We can use multi-use exhibition facility, flexible use, that's, creative space. That's perfect. Um, I mean, uh, I like is the there anybody else uh, concerned, is. or is anybody else, anyone else on the commission would like to see that change? I, I'm comfortable with the yeah. flexibility of that. Yeah. Yes. Me too. So uh, so do you prefer? Uh, um, I said two different ones. So multi-use exhibition I like facility. The first one. <laughs> multi-use exhibition. My initial concern was that thing, a gallery exhibition will limit us to a certain art form if we open our windows and yeah, multi -use our door, multi purpose yeah. uh, uh, presentation, whatever that art form is, uh, that will give us a better view. Okay. So. Um, 
what I'm hearing from the commission, so a multi-use exhibition facility is the term that the commission would like to see. I, I, or, I, the okay. only, I'm just, yeah, I, I feel like art needs it because I'm feeling like that actually is pigeonholing it a little bit more towards exhibition as yeah. opposed to a multi-use arts facility exhi and exhibition space or something along those lines. I just, I feel like what happened, it just Flexible, became, yes, I think. Flexible. I, I, I the flexible <laughs> term sounded it, even the better. The word art, because there, it could be a variety of, let's say, uh, uh, for the uh, chemical things that needs to be on the exhibit or so it needs to be a kind of a hint of that there's an uh, art nature. What it, any, I'm just any kidding. form of art. Yeah. Um, uh, how about a it? flexible use art facility? Uh, flexible use art facility and um, and creative space. I mean, I'm hearing different things. Or yeah. about just flexible use art facility. Okay. I think um, encompasses. I'm actually a little bit confused as to what the terminology in the actual document is compared to what is being presented. I guess so. In, that be um, the project so I... overview um, states that the commission is seeking a consultant or firm to conduct a comprehensive market analysis and feasibility study for a flexible use creative space that could serve as a community gallery and exhibition facility and provide opportunity for other art uses such as small scale presentations and workshops in the city. So I'm not sure, I, so I guess maybe I, perhaps I dis disagree, so I'm not sure how that's not general enough in its statement with with the follow-up of the types of uses that could be in there. I'm not sure what the I, I wouldn't be too concerned about what's in the staff report. Um, you know, the terminology, if you're comfortable with it in the RFQ, then we can stick with it. So okay. it's generally a uh, flexible use creative space that could serve as a community gallery or exhibition facility, I think really right. covers everything that you all want. Simply what it was is that the summary uses okay. different terminology than what it does, in, and I wanted to basically clarify okay. that. Oh, okay, so clarify, it was the staff report versus the RFQ yes, that we're actually exactly. talking Which is about. Exactly, you, you just okay. used okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, so the terminology used in the RFQ is, is similar to what we've discussed, so we will keep it at that, and I'll make, I'll make sure that that terminology is used consistently through the RFQ to avoid any confusion. Sounds good. Thank you. And, and uh, is there any way, my, my only other question is, um, so when, what we're expecting from this report is one recommendation. Is that what we're expecting? Or can that change? Is there room in the document that we can gauge that? Uh, but what we can do is before they kind of do their final formula for, uh, you know, telling us what the best location is, the consultant, we can ask the consultant or the firm to come and give the commission an overview just so we understand how they're approaching um, some of this analysis and then um, it, before they give us their final recommendations. So they will give the, the, the best recommendations and then they, we could ask for a secondary recommendation. Okay. Because, because I, I, would, I would prefer that and I just want to top three or say something. that. I mean, not necessarily top three, but it, it depends on what they come back with at, at the halfway point so then we can gauge from there whether there is even anything to you know, consider the top three. There might be just top two or just one. We don't even know. So. I believe in, in the RFQ, it, when, we got, when it gets down to the uh, pro forma component of it, we were asking for one or two, but that would be based upon probably up to, you know, maybe five, like we would ask like a five right. priority at, at that interim state so that we can have some discussion about where they should put their time and energy moving forward. <clears throat> okay. I, I will go ahead and, and, and move the, the approval of this, uh, the RFQ. And I'll second it. Roll call. Commissioners Derhavanesian? Yes. Kevanian? Yes. Lee? Yes. Chirikian? Yes. Chairperson Deaver? Yes. And next item. <clears throat> item six, commission staff comments. Um, just one. Oh, uh, just one little thing. Uh, as Commissioner Gregorian said, um, I went to a very interesting art exhibition in the home of uh, one of the Glendale residents. I thought that was a very nice idea because uh, the artists were saying that using an, a uh, one of the galleries in Glendale, it is an arm and a leg, and they have to pay commissions and a lot of different stuff there. 
And if that kind of an opportunity would be opened up to our artists more often, people who have homes or artists who have friends who could use their homes. But as uh, meanwhile, we also, prior to this, we had the conversation with uh, our art organizations that we used to have a mixer that once a month we were getting together and we would have the community participate, both artists and businesses. So I was thinking if we could combine those two, that means if an artist within his or her home or friend's location would have an art exhibition and we would throw in our mixers, which were not that expensive, continue with our mixers, it could be a joint effort till eventually we'll get our locations and whatever we are looking for. Uh, meanwhile, during the time and duration that all of this paperwork would be taken care of and the location would be discovered so we could accommodate artists in the community so if anybody who has a large space or home who would like to offer artists could come forward and could let our staff know and then if artists also they can find friends uh, in the community who are willing to show maybe we could put a mixer uh, that we would provide the refreshments and that way it would be a joint effort to see the community in homes of, because some people have beautiful historic homes and etc. and they might want to share for little exhibitions there. So I thought what I saw could be duplicated in the community while we are getting ready and waiting for our wonderful community location for art exhibitions prepared. Just as a point of a clarification, I, I, I occur that as a, a community call, um, can, but I just want to find out if that needs to be directed to staff in terms, because what I'm hearing is something that's about an agenda item with regard to our, um, our work plan in terms of mixers, re bringing in mixers. I, I realize this is just comment period, but I'm just asking whether that was something that was being directed to staff or asked about. If the commission would like to discuss this as a, at a future meeting, um, we can agendize it. Or if you just want it to be, uh, if you're just announcing and would like to just the community to be aware and f for them to take the initiative, then um, then we can make it clear that that's what we're looking for. Uh, could I then make a suggestion? Could we have for, I mean, this was just for announcement, but could we have uh, for next uh, meeting as part of our agenda to discuss about the mixers? Because I think that would vitalize and revitalize the community and the participation of different groups into different events that um, is happening in the city to have a mixer. Um, I, I, I understand and I, I see the value, but I think this is something that um, is, is beyond the Commission's new role um, I, in terms of uh, the, the Commission's capacity and uh, the advisory role, but we can discuss it in the coming meetings. If this is a top priority, it can supersede some of the other items that you've identified that you want to push through, and I can bring it next month. But. Um, um, if it's just to talk about uh, hosting a, a mixer, then um, that's something we, we should have included in our work plan because there is a cost associated with it. So I want to understand a little bit more of what the discussion is going to be, and if it is a priority, then it, we, need to, um, we need to figure out how much of a priority it is because we have six other programs that we need to discuss next month. I'm fine either way, but I know that especially uh, Glendale Arts Association uh, came twice and discussed about this and wanted to see if we could bring back the mixers, and I think it's a good idea. But we could discuss it in the next meeting if it's top priority or not, or it could be one of the top six or not, or et cetera. I'm fine either way. As, as chair, I'd, I'd like to ask that the staff keep it on our list to revisit after we get through the, the bulk of our work plan this year at this time. And Thank you. Thank you. May I ask? Uh, I don't know if it's Are, the right. Oh. You, the, 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 yeah, I'm done. Sorry. <laughs> Commissioner. We're sure just can. making comments. Just and, comments. Okay. Um, I don't know the, the amount of work that we have ahead of us and the plans. Uh, meeting once a month, I think it's going to be very little. Can we meet more than once a month? Because <laughs> all the plans, all the things that we have, I'm like, if we go this pace, I was like, it's going <laughs> to oh, be very slow oh, going. Oh, Commissioner Shurikian. <laughs> no, I, I mean, oh, how many two is there years any we've been doing this? <laughs> other way? We can always call for special meetings. That is correct. Uh, um, the code sets it at once a month, but you know, through the chair, um, and we have done special meetings before. We could, you know, set for, um, you know, particular issues that need to be discussed. Okay, but okay. <laughs> and they have to be televised, correct? Yes. 
<laughs> so we could schedule a special meeting um, to address things, but uh, the good thing is is some of the programs that we have uh, won't be implemented until you know summer of next year so we don't necessarily have to worry about it just this month or next month we can defer it a couple of months out but um, you know when we welcome you and we said it's like boot camp we were not we were not kidding so it is a lot of work but as necessary we can schedule special meetings we have done that when we we're discussing the work plan and the arts and cultural plan because we really wanted to move it forward so if it is necessary we can schedule Commissioner Lee. I wanted to tell everybody to save the date. Uh, Unity Festival will be coming up October 6th on Sunday. And the uh, staff has uh, recommended to put it back at Verdugo Park. So, uh, you know, look forward to that. Right now, tentatively, we have it from noon to 5. Uh, stay tuned. Um, save the date. Thank you. I think it's a great idea to have it in the park because it's cooler, the weather is nicer, it's more kind of, don't it? I think it would be fun. Commissioner Cavania? Um, I just would like to announce that uh, actually my, I, I've met a new gr uh, group of friends who are uh, musicians like I am, uh, much smarter than I am and uh, well educated. Um, but nonetheless, they are asking me to start playing again and composing again, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so. Um, my first attempt to perform with them is going to be on September 3rd at 8 o'clock at a place called ATX, just outside of uh, ATX. Uh, it's Atwater Crossing. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a restaurant atmosphere. It's a little bit laid back. It's not like, you know, suit and tie affair. Uh, however serious we take our performances, you don't have to. Um, the address there is uh, 3245 Casitas Avenue. Uh, it's in it's in Atwater again. Um, so yeah, actually, several of the performers um, are from the Glendale area, and actually, if they if the idea ever comes up to build low income housing for musicians, I think all of my friends will be so much more closer to me than um, I might even move out of my house and move there. So, um, but uh, yeah, so that's my that's these you'll be getting these once a month now since uh, um, I'm probably going to be performing. My, my friend Maxim, who is the cellist and the director, he goes, Arman, he goes, I have challenge for you. I said, what, what is that? He goes, you are going to play every ATX concert. I said, I don't know why you'd be doing this. It's not very smart on your part, but I, I will agree. And actually, he, he said he, he wants me to compose a one. He goes, just give me one page. I've been out of composing for a little while, but um, it'll be fun to get back in it. And I've been working on that ever since. So. Mr. Kiamania, is it with ticket or is it? No, actually, there is no entrance. Uh, just come out and Enjoy. sit by the bar, have a beer, have a glass of wine. If you would like, get something to eat. Uh, it's all fun and fair game. There's no charge for it. And uh, classical music? Yes, it's classical music. Uh, sorry, thank you for reminding me to talk about the program a little bit. Um, I'm going to be playing a Bach piece. Um, it's, a, it's actually a very fun piece. It's a transcription of a Marcello Oboe Concerto. Uh, which may mean nothing to a lot of people, but um, it's a very, very fun piece, very high energy piece, really fun. Um, there's going to be a guitar duo playing some Dusan Bogdanovich pieces, uh, again, really high energy stuff. And uh, Maxim will uh, invariably do a uh, imp improvisation on the piano. He's a, he's a super amazing pianist, even though he's amazing at the cello and uh, improvises. He, he had once played an improvisation, I thought he was playing Bach. And I said, what piece is that? And he goes, uh, I just made that up. And I said, well, <laughs> thank you. Um, so it's, it's gonna be a fun, fun event. Concert's probably gonna be an hour, hour and 15 minutes long. So nice little short, little fun, and you know, everybody is happy, happy. What was the date again? September the 3rd. That is what a time? Tuesday night at eight o'clock. That's at, my son's birthday. Oh, well you can bring your son. <laughs> um, at ATX again in Atwater Village. It's a Tuesday. Correct? Yes, Tuesday. Other comments? Next item. Item 7, written communications. And we have none that have not been entered in. And next item. Adjournment. Adjournment. We are adjourned. Okay. Thank you. I think we are adjourned.